When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Brian Bible Church. Brian's, it's uh, good to have you with us today. Um, we're continuing our study in the Gospel of John. We're kind of working our way it verse by verse. Now, let's, let me give you a little, let's do a little test here, a little quiz. Let's see how you all are doing, okay, so far. Um, the first 12 chapters in this Gospel are often called by scholars the book of signs. Okay, very good class. They're called the book of signs for a reason. It's because in these 12 chapters, um, the focus is on seven different miracles, seven signs that Yeshua performs as proof that He is the Son of God. Let's see how many of these signs you can remember. Anybody? Turn the water into wine. That was the first one. What's the second one? Guy at the pool. Not yet. We're going to get to him. The healing of the nobleman's son. Remember the official chapter 4. What's next? Restoring the lame man. Okay. Feeding the 5,000. Write these down. You're going to need these. Walking on water. What's... Uh, Let me give you the six. Giving sight to a blind man. What's the last one? Big miracle. If you were Lazarus, you wouldn't have forgot it. Raising Lazarus from the dead, okay? So those are the seven signs. Now as we move into chapter 13 through 21, it's called the book of glory. The book of glory. Now, in this book of glory, we're looking at a discourse called the Upper Room Discourse that runs from chapter 13 through 17. This encompasses the last night of the Lord's life He is with His disciples. He is teaching them before He goes out and is arrested and is put to death. And within this, we have what's called the farewell discourse. That They're pretty much the same, although we have an introduction in the upper room there. And then here, this runs from 1331 through 1726. It's His farewell speech to His disciples. Okay, He's leaving them, so He's challenging them, He's encouraging them. You know, he's going, and they got to keep on going. So it's his farewell speech. Now, in this discourse, he encourages them in light of his impending death and the persecution that they're going to be facing because of that. Now, we finished up chapter 13 last time, so let's jump into 14. Very familiar verse, right? Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You often will hear this. At a funeral service, okay? Um, But the problem is, verse 14 didn't come in a fortune cookie, okay? It was attached to other stuff, okay? So we have to keep this in context with what went before it, what, what went after it. He is speaking to His disciples and He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, why is Yeshua telling them not to be troubled? What are they troubled about? Okay, He's leaving them. That would be troubling, wouldn't it? That's the context. Let me say this here. This is a very bad place for a chapter break. Okay? Now when I say that, you understand I'm not being sacrilegious, okay? The Bible didn't come with chapter and verses in it. Alright? It was just a letter. These were added later, much later, and, and I really appreciate the chapter and verses. You know, we couldn't find anything without them. You know, I'd, right now we'd be look in the middle of the Gospel of John somewhere where it says, let not your heart be troubled. You'd be searching to try to find that. Okay, So I appreciate it, but this is a bad spot because you think, okay, chapter 13 is done. Boom, out of the way. Let's start in something new. This is not anything new. Alright? Not anything new at all. Yeshua tells His disciples not to be troubled because He had just been talking to them in chapter 13 about the fact that one of them is going to betray Him. And they're all shocked by that. They're looking at each other like, is it me? Is it you? Who's going to do that? They had no clue one of them was going to do that. Then he talks to Peter about the fact, Peter, you're going to deny me before the sun comes up. And so they're like, Peter? The spokesman of the group? I mean, this, is, this doesn't sound very good. And then he says, I'm leaving you guys. 
And where I'm going, you can't come. So, needless to say, they're trouble. Okay? This is troubling for them. Look at verse 1333. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, you'll seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you can't come. So you can imagine the disciples, they're confused, they're perplexed, they're troubled by what He's telling them. Their hopes and ambitions are beginning to collapse, they're kind of disintegrating around them. They had given up everything to follow Him. They quit their jobs, they left their family, and they're following Christ. And now He's going to leave them after three years? I mean, without Yeshua, I imagine they feared death for themselves. I mean, when you're with someone who can walk on water and raise the dead, you're probably pretty comfortable, you know, being with them. You know, what, what do I have to worry about, you know? But he's leaving, and they're like, what happened to us now? I mean, I mean, are we going to be put to death? Are we going to be ostracized from the Jewish society? I mean, the leaders don't like him at all. What are we going to do? Where, do we, where are we going to go? What about their dreams and their plans for Israel's future? I mean, it's just, it would be troubling. Yeshua understands they're deeply disturbed. And He wants to strengthen their faith to prepare them for what is coming. It's going to get worse. Okay? So He says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Your here is plural. He's talking to all of them. You guys, I don't want you to be troubled. Now the word troubled here, it's from the Greek word tarasso, which literally means to stir or agitate. It's used this way in John 5, 4 of the angels stirring the water in the pool. Stir or agitate. In a figurative sense, it means to anguish, to be terrified, to be frightened or horrified. It's a strong word. Now the word tarasso here is a present passive imperative verb. Which implies that the passive voice implies that Yeshua had spoken to them about leaving them. That's what's causing the trouble. All right? It wasn't caused by themselves, it's a passive voice. It's being brought on them. Now, Yeshua's word to them is a command, it's an imperative mode. It literally could be translated like this Stop being troubled. Stop it. You know, but they're like, we well, quit telling us stuff like this and we'll stop. You know, we don't like to hear this stuff. This is an action in progress, it's present tense, that needs to halt. You guys need to stop being troubled. Now, what's interesting here is the word tarasso is a word that has just been used three times in the immediate preceding context about our Lord, about his distress. He talked about the Lord stress in Lazarus' death in John 11.33. It says, when Yeshua saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in His spirit and greatly troubled. Tarasso, same word. When the Greeks came, and He sensed that the cross was eminently approaching, He said, now is my soul troubled. Tarasso. It's used in Yeshua's distress when He gave the prediction of His betrayal by one of the twelve in John 13, 21. So Yeshua understood what it meant to be troubled. He experienced this. He went through the experiences of life, all the things that we feel and experience. He's been there. Now, if this word tarasso is used of Yeshua three times in the preceding context, how can He command the disciples not to be tarasso? I mean, He was. He commands them not to be. Well, remember I said tarasso literally means to stir or agitate. It could be translated as anguish, terrified, frightened. I would say that there is a righteous stirring or agitation caused by holiness and love. I mean, we see things and we get agitated about them because you know, we know that's not what God's Word says the way it should be. You know, we see abortion and we're troubled. Why are people killing these ch children? You know? I mean, our society is so upside down, it, it isn't even funny. You know? We're fighting to protect, you know, puppies. You know, these puppies have a right to live, but babies, you know, we don't care about them. You know, it just, it, it's upside down, all right? So there is a tarasso, there is a stirring up 
I think, caused by holiness and love. And this is definitely what our Lord was experiencing. And that's how He uses the word of Yeshua. But there's also an unrighteous stirring or agitation caused by unbelief. I'm just troubled. I'm stirred because I just don't trust the Lord. This is a failure to trust Him in the midst of your problems. And that's what we often do in the midst of our problems. We fail to trust Him. And we get stirred up. And this is what the disciples were experiencing. And this is what Yeshua tells them to stop. Stop that. So to help them to stop being stirred up or agitated by the thought of His leaving, Yeshua says to them, believe in God. Believe also in Me. Now the verb... We gotta, let's do just a little bit of Greek study here, okay? And you know, try to stay with me. I think this will be helpful, alright? But the verb believe here is from the Greek pistuo. It's a present continuous tense in both instances. Both those believes are present continuous tense. Which means they are to keep on believing. Now here's the problem. Pistuo can either be in the indicative, a statement, or it can be in the imperative, a command. In each case. The spelling of the words in both moods is identical in the Greek text. So this little phrase can be translated with equal grammatical accuracy in four different ways. Okay, You can translate this, believe in God, believe in Me. Both commands. You could translate this, you are believing in God, and you are believing in Me. Statements of fact. Okay, Or you could translate this, you are believing in God, statement of fact, believe also in Me, command. What, how did I get two ones up there? There's, I don't know how I did that. Anyway, three is four, and two is three, and one is two. You got, you got the point anyway, okay? <laughs> All right, the fourth one there, believe, that's a command, and then it's a statement of fact. Believe in God, and you are believing in Me. So, grammatically, you can take that any of those ways are proper, all right? So we have to go to the context. We have to look at the context and try to figure out what, what exactly is he I think the best way to take this is number three, all right? You, statement of fact, you are believing in God. Then a command. Believe also in me. So I take it as an indicative first. You believe in God. Then I take it as an imperative command, believe in me. Now the LEB, the KJV, the RV, the EMTV, the NMS Elemental P, uh, <laughs> a lot of these Bible translations translate the first part as indicative and the second part as imperative. Now the ESV doesn't, the NASB doesn't, all right? But there's many translations that translate the first part as indicative, the second as imperative. So I see Yeshua here saying, you believe in God. So I want you to believe also in Me. Now, from the time these Jewish teenagers, these Jewish men were boys, they had been taught the Scriptures. Okay, As soon as they could speak, they'd be you know, learning the Shema of Israel. They'd be working on memorizing Scripture. So they knew Yahweh. They knew Yahweh was absolutely reliable. They knew Yahweh was an absolutely sovereign God. They could trust Him. Look at Psalm 91, verse 10. And those who know Your name put their trust in You. For You, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek You. the name in Hebrew represents character. You know, to names to us are just Bob, Mike. No, a name in Hebrew represented the person, who he was, his character. All right? So when he says those who know your name, those who know the character of God, those who understand who he is, they put their trust in him. That's just natural. If you knew him, you would trust him. You know, you can't trust someone you don't know, or it's really foolish if you do. You know, you got to know them in order to trust him. So, their world is beginning to collapse. Chaos is setting in. And in times like that, there's one thing they need to do, and that's trust in God. And he's saying, you trust in God. You believe in Him. 
You always have believed in Him. Keep doing that. So the disciples were trusting in God, and they must continue to do that. But then Yeshua says this, believe also in Me. Now, hang on here, okay? Keeping in the context in mind here, I think what Yeshua is saying, you guys believe in God. You believe in Yahweh, whom you have never seen. You trust in the invisible God. And now, I want you to trust in the invisible Christ. Remember, these disciples had a very unique relationship with Yeshua. They lived with His physical presence for three years. They walked with Him. They talked with Him. They had dinner with Him. They had conversations through the night. They stayed in the same location. They were always together. They could touch Him. They could hold Him. They could ask Him questions. That's what they're used to. But now, He is leaving the physical realm. And they'd have to trust Him just like they had trusted the Father whom they'd never seen. So the word also here is intended to link the way the disciples believe in the Father with the way they must believe in the Son. So he's saying, you do believe in the Father. You do believe in God. I want you to believe in Me that same way. Because you're not going to see Me. Now notice what Peter wrote to the exiles of the dispersion. He said, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. People, this is our experience, okay? We never walked with Yeshua. We never sat down and broke bread with Him. Walked to a town with Him. Hung out and sat at His feet and listened to Him teach. We didn't have that three-year experience of His physical presence, so we trust the invisible Christ But these disciples were used to having Him there. They're going to be going through a radical change here very quickly. It's going to be huge for them. And He's saying, you need to trust Me like you trust the Father. You trust in God who is invisible. Keep trusting in Me when I'm invisible. Because that's what's happening. He's trying to encourage them. Now, before we leave this verse, I don't want you to miss Yeshua's claim to deity here. Again, in this Gospel. Do you see the claim to deity? Well, He's urging them to trust Him the same way they trust God. Why would they do that? Because He's telling His disciples, I am God. Trust Me. And Lazarus, all the way through this Gospel, makes the case that Yeshua is God. That's so important to him. He began the book by saying this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he means Yahweh here, the God of Israel. These four Greek words may be the clearest declaration of the deity of Yeshua in all of Scripture. The Greek verb eimi, was, to be, means to be, to exist, and it suggests a continuing Continued existence. So the Word always existed. The Word was God. Always was God. Always will be God. Lazarus does not say, and the Word was divine. And the Word was like God. The Word was just under God. No! He makes the bold statement, the Word was God. He leaves no room for anyone to see Yeshua in any way other than God. That's who He is. And again, we, we've hammered that. I'll keep doing it as we go through this. It's, it's a, you know why it's so important? Because in John 8.24, he said, unless you believe that I am, unless you believe that I'm God, you'll die in your sins. That's important. Okay? You don't be wrong about who Yeshua is. It's a matter of life and death. Alright, let's move on. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'd go pre- prepare a place for you. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the King James Version here, right? What's the King James Version say here? In my Father's house are many mansions. Doesn't that sound better than rooms? You want a mansion or you want a room? Okay? Well, the mistranslation of the word mansions has called for the writing of many 
hymns, you know? How many hymns are there out there? Well, there's one called Mansion Over the Hilltop. All right? Listen to the words to this, Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. A little silver and a little gold. I'm getting by, got my cottage, got a little silver and a little gold. But, in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that's silver lined. I'd be like, well, you greedy little thing. I mean, you, they sing this hymn? Yeah, I want some gold. Give me the gold, Lord. I thought about the apostle says, silver and gold have we none. But we want some gold, don't we? It says, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander but walk on streets that are purest gold. And there's just a lot of hymns, people, on this idea of the mansion. You know, we got this mansion over there. <laughs> Leon Morris writes this, the Greek word translated in the King James Version as mansions is found only here and in verse 23 in the New Testament. It's connected with the verb that means to abide or dwell, the verb mano, which is used quite often in chapter 15. It points to places to stay. That's what it means, a place to stay. The translation mansions is due to the fact that when Jerome translated the New Testament into Latin, he used the word mansions at this point and the King James translated translators used the English word that was closest to that, and so they came up with mansions. But the Latin word means lodging places. It doesn't mean mansion. It refers to places to stay and not some elaborate house. The Greek for room is mone, which as Morris said is only used twice in the New Testament here and in 1423. Look at 14.23. I think it helps us understand this word. Yeshua answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our mansion with him. No. No, they're not making a mansion. They're ma okay? It, it's a home. It's a dwelling place. Now, the word home here, Monet, is the same word in verse 2 that the King James translates as mansion, but here they translate it as abode. Same word. Yet, they translate it in the same chapter, mansions and then abode. Well, you know, there wouldn't probably have been many songs written about my abode in heaven. You know, it's not quite as sound as great as a mansion. But based on verse 23, I think we could say that Monet has the idea of dwelling. In my Father's house are many dwelling places because God's going to come and He's going to dwell with us. The image of dwelling place gives us a picture of the oriental house in which the sons and the daughters have dwelling places under the same roof as their parents. In other words, we're going to be in the Father's house. Not a mansion down the hill from... No, we're going to live in the Father's house. Well, what is the Father's house? What's He referring to there? Well, we find this term Father house used in chapter 2, he says, he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of trade. So he's, what's he talking about there? Well, the temple in Jerusalem. That's called the father's house. But here's what's interesting. Lazarus in chapter 2, 19-22, reinterprets the temple as Yeshua's body, which is going to be destroyed in death and then rebuilt in resurrection after three days. So our dwelling place, people, is in Yeshua. Okay, He is the new temple. We saw that when we were in chapter 2. Now the temple at Jerusalem is called the Father's house, but it's only a copy. All right, We see that in Hebrews 9.23. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So you have the copy and then you have the heavenly realities. The temple was just a copy of the heavenly things. Look at Hebrews 9.24 For Christ has entered not into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So Christ has gone into heaven itself. 
The temple was the Father's house in the sense that it was a copy of the Father's house, which is heaven. So when he's talking about his Father's house, that's what he's talking about, heaven. Yeshua cleansed the Father's house on earth and then destroyed the copy so that we might gather, to, he might gather together his people into the place that he would prepared for them in heaven. So in the Father's house are many places to dwell. There's a lot of room, he's saying. Okay, it's a, you heard the song, it's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms, all right? There's a lot of room in the Father's house for us to hang out in. Plenty of room in the Father's house. And that's what he's saying here. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'd go for a place for you? In other words, there's plenty of room for everybody. I would have told you if it's different than that. All right? So in his Father's house, there are a lot of rooms. And he says in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, so he's told him he's leaving. Now he's saying, the reason I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come again and will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now that had to be comforting to them. Oh, he's leaving, but he's going to come back and get us. All right? Because the thing that was troubling their hearts is, we're not going to be with the Lord anymore. So our Lord tells them, don't worry. Coming back soon, I'm going to get you to be with me. All right, he says, if I go and prepare a place for you. How was Yeshua going to prepare a place for them? Was he going to the Father's house and then, you know, take out his hammer and start adding some rooms on? Yeah. No, I don't believe he was. That's the whole thing. You know, most people look at Yeshua as a carpenter. He's probably more a brick mason than a carpenter. Right? They, everything was stones over there, all right? They built with stones, okay? So the place that he talks about going is the Father's house in heaven. That already existed when Yeshua said these words. So what he means by going to prepare a place for them is, I'm going to the cross. Okay? Because until I go to the cross, you can't get into heaven. So I'm preparing a place so you can get into that place. It's the cross. It's the resurrection. It's the ascension. It's the return. It's the Christ event. I'm going to do that. That's, that's preparation for believers to join Him. So that's what He means. I'm going to prepare a place. I'm not going to add on some rooms. I'm not going to build you a mansion down the street. You know, I'm not going to do it. I'm making a way for you to enter into the presence of God. And He says, I'm going to come again. I'm going to take you to Myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, what He's coming again. What return is He talking about here? Well, some interpreters view this return as a rapture. Okay, this is a rapture of the church. That's what he's talking about. Others say, no, it's referring to a second coming. Another view is that he's speaking of the believer's death. Okay, when they die, they'll go be with them. So, what is this talking about? Well, let's start with the rapture first. This rapture of the church idea is not a historical teaching. Alright? This rapture theology, theology has only been around for the past couple hundred years. And listen to this. Predominantly, in America. This is an American idea, all right? The biblical scholar N.T. Wright refers to the rapture as an American obsession. And notes that few Christians in the UK hold any sort of belief in it. I guess the brothers across the pond are a little sharper than we are in some things, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is the verse that this whole rapture thing comes from. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. All right, the, verse, the words caught up here are the Greek word, is the Greek word harpazo. And it means to snatch away. This is where the word rapture comes from. Now we have to ask, what does the Bible mean when it says that we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air? Does this mean we'll be physically sucked up into the sky? Is that what he's talking about? What does the word air mean? Is it our atmosphere? The air we breathe? Well, if you look at other uses of this word, for example, in Ephesians 2.2, 2, the word air is used as another word for the heavenly or the spiritual realm. Okay? So we're going to be caught up into the spiritual realm. That's what's going to happen. Not sucked up off the face of the ground. You know, pulled up into the air. It's not our physical body that is raptured. It's the Christian himself who is raptured as he's brought into the presence of the Lord. The dead believers were resurrected when Christ returned. 
all other Christians were caught up at that time. Now our text in John 14 is talking about Yeshua's second advent. He's talking about the parousia. He's talking about the second coming. This is going to take place at the end of the Old Covenant age. All right? The, the New Covenant age has no last days. No end times. Why? Because it's an everlasting covenant. You know, people, almost everybody believes we're in the last days. The last days of what? The planet, they think. Okay, this is, the earth's going to be all burned up. So, no, when, you, when they talk about the last days, they're talking about the last days of the old covenant. The writer of Hebrew tells us this. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. He's coming back. Not to deal with sin. Why? Because He dealt with that on the first coming. All right? But watch. To save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. See, this looks ahead to the return of Christ as His gathering of all believers unto Himself and his, into His eternal kingdom. It's at that time that salvation is complete. See, the first century believers lived in what was called the transition period. The new covenant had been inaugurated at Pentecost. But salvation was not complete until it was consummated 40 years later at A.D. 70 with the return of Christ. Until Christ came back, salvation was a promised event, but it was not completed. Look at what the Scriptures say. Luke 18.30 Who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. See, they don't get eternal life till the age to come. Now, that was the age to come for them, which is the age that we live in. Eternal life came with a consummated new covenant age in AD 70. So when Christ says, I'm going to come again, I'm going to take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, he's talking about the second coming at the end of the Jewish age when he will gather all believers unto himself and bring them into his eternal kingdom. That's the Father's house, which is heaven. Like I said, those saints that had died, that were dead, were taken from Sheol into the Father's house, into the presence of God in heaven. Those who were alive were given eternal life. All right? So they were seated with Christ in heavenly places at that time. From then on, from 8070 on, when someone trusts Christ, they are immediately brought into the spiritual realm, given eternal life, seated with Christ in the heavenly places, and that's how that's our existence until we die here physically and then move there for the rest of our lives. So him saying this to the disciples has to be comforting. He's going to come back. He's going to get them. They're like, okay, you're not going to just leave us here alone then. And it's going to get more comforting as it goes in because he's going to talk about the Spirit. I'm going to send you the Spirit to take care of you while I'm gone. All right? He's going to come back and get him. He says that where I am, you may be also. Now people, this is the simplest, in a sense, the greatest description of what heaven is like. Heaven is to be with Christ. Wherever Christ is, that's heaven. Okay? We're going to be with Him where He is. Now, Yeshua's announcement of preparing a place for them and then returning to get them is reminiscent of the preparation the first century bridegroom would make after the acceptance of the betrothal contract. Don't think anything the way we do things, okay? The betrothal was legally binding, but he would, they would get betrothed, then the husband would leave. He'd go back to the father's house and he would prepare a place for the bride. And then when the father said the time was right, he would go back and get his bride and take her to the Father's house. And in the same way, Yeshua prepared a place for His bride, the church, and then came back and took them to be in the Father's house in AD 70, at the end of that Jewish age, that old covenant age. And then Yeshua says to him, you know, I'm going, I'm going to prepare this place. And He goes, you know the way where I'm going. Now the way here He was going was the cross. The resurrection. They'd already talked about that. He told them this back in chapter 12, verse 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to Myself. He said this to show them by what kind of death He was going to die. He's going to draw people. He's going to be lifted up on the cross. He's going to draw people. The disciples didn't understand at this time that Yeshua was the way to the Father 
via the cross. So the way to the Father was through the cross. For us, as Christians, our way to the Father is through the Son. We trust in Him. And even though they didn't realize, they knew the way. Because they knew Christ. Well, Thomas speaks up and he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Now, Yeshua says you know the way. Thomas says you don't. Which one of them do you think is right? Well, you know, Thomas is wrong here, okay? They did know where Yeshua was going over and over. He had taught them that He had come from the Father. He was going back to the Father. So they did know that, but they're, they're stressed out right now. So they're like, Lord, you've got to be more specific. How do we, how's this going to work out? Look at John 7.33. Yeshua said, I will be with you a little longer. And then I'm going to Him who sent me. You will seek me, and you'll not find me. Where I am, you can't come. All right? Going to Him. Thomas is perplexed, just as the rest of the disciples are perplexed. So he asks, can I get some clarification on this? And Thomas' question in verse 5 is really a setup for verse 6, which contains another important of the I Am sayings. Here's another verse, 14.6. It's very familiar to people. People memorize this verse. People understand this verse. Well, I don't know how much they understand it, but they know what it says, okay? Yeshua said to him, you know, we don't know the way. And so Yeshua says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is the sixth of the I am with a predicate nominative. And the use of I am is a clear reference to the divine name of Yahweh. Points back to Exodus 3.13 where Yahweh says, I am who I am. All right. So every time Yeshua uses this expression, and He uses it, I think about 14 times in the Gospel of John. He's saying, I am Yahweh. I am the God of Israel in the flesh. I'm the way to the Father. All right? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, commenting on this, Hall Harris writes this. However, the context suggests that the three ideas are not strictly coordinate. The next statement, no one comes to the Father except through me, seems to relate primarily to the first predicate, I am the way. Thus, we suggest that the two remaining predicates, the truth and the life, are epigetical of explanatory to the first, I am the way, that is, the truth and the life. So Yeshua is saying, stop being troubled, guys, about my departure. Continue to trust me as you trust in the invisible God. I'm leaving you. But the only reason I'm leaving is to go pre prepare a place for you in my Father's house and then I'm going to come back and get you. And you know the way. But then Thomas says, how can we know the way? To which Yeshua responds, I am the way. That's how you know it. You know me. You know the way. See, this is an exclusive, absolute statement. Yeshua and He alone is the way. It's not I am a way. I am the way. The only way. Now the Greek here for way is hadas, and it means a road or a way. The only way you can get there. Yeshua is saying, I'm the only way to the Father. Now, this is similar to what we've already seen Him say in John 10, where He says, I'm the door. If anyone enters by Me, He will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. He's the door. There's the only door, again. The only way to eternal life. Now compare this with what Yeshua taught back in Matthew 7. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So he warns them, you need to start out right by entering through the narrow gate. Now in light of the rest of the New Testament, this could refer to man's narrow and restricted way to God. Which is, listen, it's Christ. That's it. That's narrow. That's restricted. You only come through Christ. You can't come any other way. It's not by your works, not by your baptism, not by your church. None of these things work. It's only Christ. You know, before the title Christian was adopted by the believers in the church of Antioch, they used to call themselves The Way. I think that's a pretty cool title. 
their founder was the way. They said the church is the way because they were proclaiming the gospel of Christ. So Yeshua says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Now within the context, as Harris said, the most important term is the way. The other two terms explain how Yeshua is the way. The way is more dominant in view of Thomas' question. Thomas says, how do we know the way? And he says, I am the way. All right. The others are a relative position, truth and life. So Yeshua is the way to God because He is the truth from God and the life from God. He is the truth because He embodies God's supreme revelation. He is the life because He contains and imparts divine life. Yeshua here is summarizing and connecting many of the revelations about Himself that He had previously given. To know Yeshua is to know the way to the Father. For He is the way. The way to the Father is Yeshua. The way to the truth about the Father is Yeshua. The way to the life of God is Yeshua. In John 5.26, Yeshua said this, For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. He has life. He gives it to whom He wishes. 5.21, He says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life To whom He will. So again, Yeshua makes a claim that excludes all but Himself as the source of a real relationship to God. He and He alone is the life. Apart from Him, there's no spiritual life. Apart from Him, there is only spiritual death. In 1 John 5.12, He says this, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So John 14.6 sums up most of the Christology of John's Gospel. It's very closely related to the prologue. He says the same stuff in the very beginning in the prologue. Now he's just kind of saying it again, but it just kind of wraps a lot of stuff up. Let me share with you the meditation of Thomas Akempis on this verse. I thought it was pretty interesting. He says, Follow thou me, I am the way and the truth and the life. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way which thou must follow, the truth which thou must believe, the life which thou must hope. I am the inviolable way, the infallible truth, the never-ending life. I am the straightest way, the sovereign truth, life true, life blessed, life uncreated. Pretty good, Thomas. Then Yeshua says this, No man comes to the Father except through Me. Alright, Yeshua's claim here renders invalid all other offers of spiritual salvation. All other ways are canceled out by this. This exclusive and judgmental nature of this claim is abhorrent to our humanistic, postmodern, post-Christian society with its non-discriminatory live and let live all roads lead to God mentality. This is a dogmatic statement. Nobody comes to God except through me. That's it. You know, a lot of people want to, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, and I believe in this, and I believe in that, and I believe in all these things. Well, that's not how it works. He's the only way. It's a dogmatic statement. It really is. But in this statement, Yeshua clearly affirming there's no other path Linking heaven and earth but Himself. He's the only way you're going to get there, people. It's through Christ. Salvation doesn't come as, listen, the Jews of those days believe through the law. He's telling them, no, you don't get there through the law. You only get to the Father through Me. Well, what about the sacrificial system? No, that's no good anymore. You only get there through Me because I'm the ultimate sacrifice. The religious practices, none of that. The overthrow of foreign oppressors. They all connected this in the first century. He said, none of those ways work. Is there any other way? Is there any other means to salvation except through Yeshua of Nazareth? No. That's what that says. That's not hard to understand right there. There's no way except Yeshua. Peter will affirm this truth in his great homily before the high priest in the Sanhedrin in Acts 4. He says this, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Eternal life? 
Eternal forgiveness is only available through Christ. The question had been, in what name has this lame man been healed? And this replies, you know, that the only name that heals, the only name that saves, is Yeshua. That's it. No one comes to the Father but by me. That seems clear. But, the Catholic Church teaches that those who never had a chance to hear the Gospel of Salvation will be saved by righteously living the natural law in obedience to the dictates of their conscience. You just live out what your conscience tells you. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 847, this is official Catholic doctrine, states this. This affirmation is not aimed at those who, through no fault of their own, see you got these people that just there's no fault, they didn't do anything wrong, no fault of your own, do not know Christ in His church. Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or His church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart. What's wrong with that? Paul wrote in Romans, no man seeks after God. But the Catholic Church says for those who do seek Him, well, none do. So we could just stop right there. All right, But they go on, and moved by grace, try in their actions to do His will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. Those two may achieve eternal salvation. So according to Catholic doctrine, you can come to the Father apart from Christ. And you see, it's through the dictates of your conscience. You're doing what your conscience tells you. What's the problem with that? The conscience is programmed by what you put in it. Garbage in, garbage out. If you're taught all your life, the God we worship requires human sacrifice. And the woman in India will go down to the Ganges River and she'll throw her baby into the river to the crocodile God and feel really good about it because that's what she's been taught. Her conscience is, is wrong. So man's conscience doesn't help him at all unless it's been taught right. So obeying your conscience is not going to get you there. When Christ says, I, that's it, I'm the only way, that's what He means. He doesn't mean you can go around it if you don't know the Gospel. If you've never heard the Gospel, that's okay. You get there your own way. Well, it's not only the Catholics okay, who are messed up on this. There's something called the two-covenant theology, which teaches that there's two separate covenants. There's one between God and Israel, and another between God and the church of Christ. So we got two different covenants. And rather there being one way of redemption through faith in Yeshua for the Jews and the Gentiles alike, God's original covenant relationship with His ancestral people Israel remains separate from the new covenant relationship with the Gentile nations through the Lord Christ. Now, two separate, one for Jews, one for Gentiles. Right off the top of your head, what's wrong with that? Who was the duke? Who made up the church? They were all Jews. So the old covenant's for you, the new covenant. Why are you teaching the new covenant to Jews? This is, this is Christianity 101, people, okay? But John Hagee, who preaches to millions of people, holds this erroneous view. Hagee holds the two covenant view. And here's what's really scary he's got the ear of politicians. Like he's some spiritual, knowledgeable person and they talk to him. And he's all about protecting Israel. It's illegal in Israel to teach the Gospel of Christ. But let's support them. Does that make any sense to any of you? John Hagee holds this view. Here's what Hagee writes. There is no form of Christian evangelism that has failed so miserably as evangelizing the Jewish people. It seemed to work pretty good in the first century. They already have, the Jewish people, already have a faith structure. Everyone else, if you're not Jewish, everybody else, whether you're Buddhist or Baha, you need to believe in Jesus. Everybody needs to believe in Jesus, he says, but not Jews. Jews already have a covenant with God that has never been replaced by Christianity. So the Jews don't need the Gospel. 
So I'm like, Yeshua, what are you doing talking to all those Jews? They don't need you. When he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, except for Jews, you got a different way, truth, and life. But he's talking to Jews when he says that. So this is totally confusing and it makes no sense. What is wrong with Hagee? I mean, does he know how to read? Does he know for the first ten years of the church there was nothing but Jews in that church? Yeshua says, no one comes to the Father. Nobody but by me. But Hagee says, Jews already have a covenant with God. has never been replaced by Christianity. I'd say Hagee and Yeshua have a problem with one another. One of them is probably wrong, okay? Yeshua says, nobody. And listen, people, when he says this, he's talking to Jews. Only Jews. That upper room, bunch of Jewish disciples. They're all sitting there listening to this. And they're thinking, huh, well, he's telling us this so we can tell the Gentiles later because we don't need any of this. No, it's ridiculous. All right, <laughs> David Stern. Are any of you familiar with David Stern? He's a doctor of theology, he's a biblical scholar, and he's a Messianic Jew living and teaching in Israel. He's the author of the Jewish New Testament Commentary. So he's writing a Jew tes- the Testament Commentary from the Jewish perspective, okay? He writes in reference to Yeshua's statement in verse 6, no one comes to the Father but through me. He writes this, this challenge strikes at the heart of non-Messianic Judaism's denial of Yeshua's Messianic meteor. Or in other words, he said, well, this destroys the fact that the Jews think they can come to Christ. They can come to God without Christ. Unfortunately for this theory, and he's talking about the the two covenant theory here, it does not fit the New Testament facts at all. Well, that doesn't bother people today, okay? He says the tolerance for Christianity that it produces, and see, that's what happens with with Hagee. Hagee is accepted by the Jews. Why? Because he's promoting them. He's for them. You don't have to believe what we believe. You don't have to believe in Jesus. Well, you don't need that. So they got a tolerance now. Judaism and Christianity can get along in one big happy family. The tolerance for Christianity that it produces is not tolerance of what the New Testament say is true. So that's a problem, right? He says, I love this. He says, this is what we've been talking about. Yeshua was a Jew who presented himself to Jews. And these Jews remained Jewish after they came to trust him. He rarely presented the gospel to Gentiles. Indeed, it was only with difficulty and supernatural intervention that his Jewish disciples came to realize that Gentiles could join God's people through trusting Yeshua without converting to Judaism. In the book of Acts, Kepha's initial sermon, Kepha, that's Peter, that's his Jewish name, his initial sermons presented Yeshua to Jews as the Jewish Messiah. He stood up at Pentecost and he's preaching to Jews the New Covenant. The New Covenant promised in Jeremiah to Jews was being delivered to Jews who don't even need it. Man, God messed up. In his letter to the Romans, Shaul, that's Paul, that's his Jewish name, states that salvation through Yeshua is God's good news to the Jew especially. Stern goes on to say, in the words of this verse, if the words of this verse are authentically Yeshua's, and if the two covenant theory does not fit the facts, then we are left with a statement whose audacity, breath, apparent arrogance, and sheer chutzpah pose a serious problem. What exclusively, what intolerance for a religion to accept Yeshua's claim to be the only way to God? It requires a decision either to acknowledge Yeshua's position as the Messiah, the Son of God, or to reject Him as a madman and a fraud and to reject religion centering on him as a deceptive at best. There is no terra quid, that's middle ground, for if one holds that Yeshua was a great teacher, the unavoidable question is, and why don't you believe him? (laughs) You know, he. oh yeah, I just think Yeshua was a great teacher. Well, then you ought to believe what he says if he's a great teacher. And act on his great teaching. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, long quote by Stern, but I thought it was worth bringing out there because people, this is the idiocy of this two covenant theology. 
Yeshua and his disciples all preach to Jews the salvation that was theirs, and yet they say, well, that's not for Jews. Wow. I, I believe Hagee can read, but I don't know what's going on there. I just think he's so blind to this thing. I want to stand by Israel, you know, because he that touches Israel touches the apple of God's eye. Listen, God is done with Israel. They wouldn't believe in him, so he turned from them. He destroyed their temple, shut off their sacrifices, and he turned, he gave to the kingdom to other people, okay, which are all people who believe in him by faith. All right? Now, verse 7 says, Yeshua says, If you had known me, you'd have known my father also. You get that, right? From now on, you do know me. You do know him, and I have seen him. Now, there is a variant here, and there's some argument over words that are actually in this manuscript. The variant reads, if you have come to know me as you do, you shall know my Father also. And I think that's the original reading when Yeshua is emphasizing the truth of 118. He says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Okay, Yeshua made God known. So to know Yeshua is to know the Father. Since Yeshua is the way to the Father. Coming to Yeshua is coming to the Father. Knowing Yeshua is knowing the Father. Seeing Yeshua is seeing the Father. That's what he's telling them. They said, we don't know the way. He goes, I am it. You know me? You know the way. So Yeshua in this text is beginning to comfort the hearts of his disciples by telling them, I'm going away, but I'm just going because I've got to prepare a place for you. You'll never get into heaven unless I pay your sin debt in full. And then I'm going to return. And I'm going to take you to the Father's house. You know Him because you know the way. Because I am the way. People, the Gospel is all about Yeshua. The only way anybody gets into heaven is through Yeshua. Because He's the only way that anybody will ever get there. It's trusting in Him. There aren't alternatives. There aren't things you have to add to it. It's not, I am the way, and then you've got to do these other things too. No, it's just simply trusting Him. Faith in the finished work of Christ, believing that He died on the cross for your sin debt. He paid your way to heaven. There's nothing you can add to that. You trust Him. He says, I'll bring you to heaven. Because I did it all. I did it all for you. It's all about Him. And it's just sad that we got these preachers today with huge pulpits and big voices proclaiming a doctrine that's blasphemous. It goes totally against the New Testament. All right, I'm done. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank You this morning for the opportunity to look at Your Word. Lord, I thank You for it. It's truly living and active. It's, it pierces, Lord. It divides asunder soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It's a discerner of our thoughts and intents. Thank You, Lord. I pray this morning that everybody who hears this message would be a Berean. They wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't reject it. They'd search it out to see if these things are so. Father, I can't imagine what it would have been like to walk with you, have fellowship with you, sit and eat meals with you, walk through the countryside, listen to you teach for three years, and then find out that you were leaving. And as Yeshua encouraged those men, believe in me the way you believe in the Father. Because I'm no longer going to be with you in front. Thank you, Lord, that even though we don't see you, we believe. We trust you, Lord. Thank you for your grace to us. Amen. Questions, comments? Yes? Here? Well, I can only imagine. Uh, I think there's a song like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that for Jesus, for Yeshua to tell his disciples that he believed it would be like suddenly finding out a family member had died. Yeah, but it's so, it's even so much no, more beyond that, yeah. though, because like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm with this guy. Now, the, Ro I mean, the Romans are not all that favorable of them, but the Jews hate them also. You know, everybody's kind of against them, but... Who cares because <laughs> he raises dead people, he walks on water, he teleports a boat that's in the middle of the sea automatically to the land. I'm like, wouldn't you kind of be feeling invincible? You know, like, hey, I'm with Yeshua. 
You know, I'd be walking right next to him. You know, yeah, me and you should work together, you know. I mean, and then to say, I'm leaving you, you know, wait a minute. How are we going to get on without you around here? You know, I just, I can't imagine. I can't imagine how difficult it would be. Anybody else? Yes, Dan. I think you said this before, like in Luke 1830. Uh, you know, like in the present age, you know, if we were still living in the present age, we would not have eternal life, right? Right, if we were living in what the Bible calls this age. You know, you read that throughout Scripture. This age and the age to come. Well, that's written 2,000 years ago, and this age to them is that age they lived in. But that age was coming to an end because it was a Jewish age. It ended at AD 70 when the temple was destroyed and the sacrifices ceased. Then we were in the age to come. So we read, that's the problem. People read the Bible today and they say, oh, this age, not, it's not written to you. That was written 2,000 years ago. Pretend you're 2,000 years back and reading it. Okay? This age, the one you're in, the age to come, you're in the age to come. But I'll tell you, most, most commentators still think we're living in that age, which is, wow, we're way off. Okay? Gary? I wonder if Hagee realizes that God ended the old covenant with the Jews. He put them into that. He recognizes a lot of things, all right? All right, Mike Sullivan wrote in. Hey, Mike, it's good to hear from you. He says, since the church is both described as the bride and the kingdom of priests, perhaps the rooms on the Father's house are both the honeymoon suite and the side rooms the priests lived in and were connected to the temple. I, I think that's very possible. I mean, that's the thing. There's so many illusions here. you know. But I think most of us don't understand that wedding ceremony. So when you're, she was talking, I'm going to prepare a place to come back. They would have been thinking, oh yeah, the, the husband leaves, gets the house ready, comes and gets you. You know, he's coming back. That's the, mo the main thing of the story. He's coming back to get you. All right, but yeah, there's, there's different. There's a lot of allusions in there, especially when you're reading Lazarus. He, he, he likes to use a lot of uh, different ways of saying the same thing. 